Hello, church, and welcome into this time of worship. I hope and pray that you are doing well, and a special welcome to any of our guests and visitors checking us out this week. Whether you are a regular comer to this church, a regular viewer, or this is your first time, uh, there are many opportunities in the life of our church to learn, to serve, and to connect. And so some opportunities, if you look through the weekly emails or want to get on the weekly emails, you can let us know. But some opportunities that are coming up are we have continuing adult education with our testimony class. We are wrapping up the year with Sunday school and youth groups. And even if you haven't attended one this year, you are still welcome. We have opportunities to give and serve through the donation of hygiene supplies to make hygiene kits or even help with our annual rummage sale. And of course, there are opportunities to connect and to pray for one another as well. So I invite you to please check those opportunities out as we engage in the life of the church beyond worship. But now is a time for worship. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to praise God and reorient our lives to God's mission. Please join us in the call to worship. The risen Christ has made us his body to, to love, love, serve, and, and care, care for each it. other. The risen Christ has made us his body, calling us in every language and from every background. The risen Christ has made us his body, giving us grace to live his way. We join with God's people in every time and place to seek the Spirit's purpose. Come, let us worship. God, you call us into the story you are still telling in your creation and through your people. We confess that we are prone to freezing the action, assuming that the moment we like best can be the way of things for all time. And even when we recognize that problem when someone else does it, we admit we'd rather not see it in ourselves, and so we unthinkingly replicate brokenness instead of following the new thing you are doing into the next chapter. Forgive, Forgive us for becoming, becoming so rigid in our ideas about you 
that we leave people behind in our quest for growth and create hierarchies of your gifts. Return our attention to your truth that we may follow your way and find ourselves in your abundant life. We ask in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Holy God, you call us into community that we may live out your vision together. By your abundant grace and through your forgiveness, focus our hearts now that we may be faithful in a world that offers far too many other ways that do not lead to life. Reveal, Reveal your majesty, majesty, give us the words to proclaim your story, and empower us with your spirit to serve you with joy in every place. Amen. Amen. In worship today, we're going to hear some scripture about a ministry involving food. And so here I am in our church kitchen, because I think when we talk about meal ministries, it's an important time that we can talk about the gifts that different people bring to preparing the meal and the gifts that different people bring to uh, being and making church happen. And so when we're making a meal, there are things that we're better at or maybe worse at. Um, for example, you know, in my house, I do a lot of the chopping of things and getting things going just because I don't mind doing it and I can do it a little quicker and better. And then my wife usually is better at measuring things. I'm not a detail person, and usually she's better at putting things in the oven than I am too. If it's in the oven, I'm not good at cooking it. If it's on the stove top, I do okay. So that's another example, and there's other people who feel that same way. And maybe there's some people in the church who just can't stand cooking, or they're not very good at cooking. And that's okay, because we have other things that people can do when we're serving a meal. They can help with other preparation, help with the cleaning, help with welcoming people. So there's many gifts that are used uh, as we're making a meal for people in the church. And the church is the same way, the wider church, beyond just the meals. Of course, there are people good at doing that, but there's also people who are good at calling folks and caring for people, praying for one another. And sometimes we call those people deacons, uh, but everybody does that in some way. Uh, we have people who are really good at getting up and reading scripture or leading the prayers in worship and like liturgists that we have in worship. Um, we have pastors who preach and do those kind of things. And we have uh, people who are really good at uh, numbers, so maybe they're handling the finances and the money in the church. We have folks who are really welcoming presence, so they're the greeters in the church. And I think that's what's wonderful about being the church, is that we get to use all of our gifts, all of our talents, and none of them are better than the other, and they're all needed as we do ministry together. And that's really cool because everybody has a gift or a talent and something to contribute to the life of the church. And so do you as children as well. Um, so be thinking about where you can serve in the church. I know it's a bit of a different time right now as we're outside the building, but guess what? We still serve the church when we're outside the building as well. So let's have a prayer and we'll continue on with hearing that scripture. Dear God, thank you for a variety of gifts and giving each one of those gifts and each one of those people who has those gifts a purpose and a place in the church. Whether it's chopping or measuring or cooking or doing the dishes, greeting, caring for one another, leading worship, doing some cleaning, all of those are gifts that we give to grow the church. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving us a place. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray together as we prepare to hear God's word. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the Spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. As before we begin our reading, uh, I just want to share that it is fitting that we are moving from the Gospel of Luke and into the book of Acts in this year as we continue through the narrative lectionary. Acts is essentially the second part of Luke's account of Jesus' ministry and the early church, with many of the themes remaining the same across both parts of Luke's story. Inclusion, crossing boundaries, and of course, conflict both within the community and within the wider society in which this Jesus movement occurs. Those are themes present in both Luke's gospel and in the book of Acts. 
Where Jesus was the primary disruptive force of the gospel, the Holy Spirit is the subversive agent of the book of Acts, working through the disciples to expand beloved community and proclaim the good news. We will backtrack to the beginning of Acts and the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday next month. But today we will hear about the growth of the church, some growing pains, and the witness of Stephen as we fast forward a few months past Easter Sunday. We will begin the first part of our reading today with Acts chapter 6. And so our reading begins. Now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and the serving and serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. In this per first part of our reading for today, we encounter the first big conflict of the early church community. The first big conflict was not over some theological idea, nor was it over interpretation of scripture. It had nothing to do with worship times or styles, and really was not even so much a struggle amongst leadership. Instead, it was about food with the conflict happening in the kitchen as part of a community dinner or a Meals on Wheels program. Okay, so it was not actually some epic controversial conflict, and it was dealt with pretty quickly according to the account in the book of Acts. Yet the way this conflict was handled is huge. It was a big important moment in the life of the church, even though the response was a bit flawed. The apostles' demeaning attitude toward waiting tables is clearly evident. And the patriarchal approach to appointing seven men to oversee things is not lost on me. As a church, we still have a lot of work to do on these two fronts when it comes to honoring the work and the abilities of people across the spectrums of vocation and gender identities. Still, in this flawed response to this particular conflict, the Holy Spirit was at work in the community of the faithful. In this moment, the church was given order, diaconia was present, and new gifts were given office within the life of the community. A wrong was made right, widows were no longer ignored, people were fed. Even more so, new leaders were lifted up from a group that, at best, was barely seen as belonging and at worst, was seen as complete outsiders because of their language or their race. Reparative justice happens in this moment. The apostles, as leaders of the church, could have decided to keep their heads down when this conflict came to their attention. They could have decided to stay small, both in number and in impact, serving only those who spoke their language or looked like themselves. But instead, they chose another route. They chose to let the Holy Spirit be at work in their midst and embrace the challenges and conflicts that come with growth. They recognize the need to bring others into leadership, to ordain them before the community and give them a place in which to lead. These seven that they appointed 
would bring order to the kitchen and outreach service of meals. Two of them would not stay in the kitchen for very long, however. Philip, as we hear about, we'll hear about next week, gets out and shares the good news, bringing new people and new perspectives into the life of the community. And Stephen, who we are about to hear about, is going to call the establishment to task. As so often happens when we welcome new people into community, they bring with them new perspectives and new energy and even new risks. So let's hear now how the Holy Spirit was at work in Stephen. As our reading continues in, Luke chap- in Acts chapter 6 and 7. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against the holy, this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the wilderness, as God directed when he spoke to Moses, ordering him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations which God drove out before our ancestors. And it was there until the time of David, who found favor with God and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is this place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? Stephen continued, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, You are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that receive the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of the Lord and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Spirit was working through this kitchen worker, this waiter of tables, as he does great wonders and speaks big words. Stephen says to anyone who will listen, the church is bigger than the kitchen or any one aspect of ministry. Our faith is bigger than a building. 
true words today just as they were then. And another reminder that we need to hear as we continue to spend time away from the church building. In this text, we do not hear of the apostles or other church leaders saying to Stephen, go back to the kitchen, know your role, return to serving tables. They did not say that. While it may not have been in the church job description given to Stephen, it seems that God has a wider sense of call for this disciple. Stephen is going to create controversy through his speaking and his wondering, yet he is not rebuked or censored. The Spirit was moving in Stephen, so he dared to speak. And this early community of Christ followers, they followed his lead They let the Spirit be at work in him. Not so with the establishment, however. They want Stephen silenced, and by any means possible. They do not want to entertain his words or allow his vision to go any further. When confronted with change and new perspectives or a better way forward, the establishment time and time again puts God on trial. They did so with Jesus, and here they do it with Stephen, who is alive with the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus shared familiar scripture pieces with his prosecutors and even from the cross, Stephen is preaching a similar refrain of prophetic teachings that his questioners and his executioners should have known. Sharing these words until he breathes his last breath. Stephen takes a knee preaching justice, embodying grace, and speaking truth to power. It's easy for us to condemn the synagogue of the freedmen, to condemn Saul and those who cast their stones upon this disciple, especially from our vantage point, looking back at a text like this with 2,000 years between us and them. We cannot look upon modernity with such hindsight. That is the conflict we find ourselves within today. When someone speaks prophetically about the way the world is working or not working, do we respond as the opponents of Stephen did, attempting to silence them or cover our ears when they speak? Or do we respond as the ancient church did, ordaining such voices as worthy of being heard? Do we uphold the Pax Romana, the peace of the empire, Or do we side with God's justice? In more biblical words, do we stifle the work of the Holy Spirit? Or do we let the flames of holy work kindle our communities so that all may know the warmth of God's inbreaking kingdom in the world? Make no mistake, we are a nation in conflict. We are a society that is very conflicted. Systemic racism is made manifest in policing, in courtrooms, education, immigration, medicine, and every aspect of our lives. Daily, we have become witness to the hold of this original sin on our nation. Voices have been crying out for justice, for a place at the table, for their issue and their complaint to be recognized by leadership. Today, and for many lifetimes, they have cried out. And we can choose to shrink away from conflict or to try to silence the voices of those speaking out. We can cover our ears and hide our faces in the sand. But when we do that, all we do is shrink or stagnate the work of the church by being unwilling to go into these places of conflict. These are big issues but they are conflicts worthy of our attention and worthy of our devotion in both big and small ways. Like the apostles, our response may be flawed. It may even seem insignificant as it only deals with a small part of our ministry or only affects what happens in the church kitchen. Yet when we listen to the voices of those left unheard, when we are open to the new arenas into which the Holy Spirit is calling us, Something amazing happens. 
What starts in the church kitchen can expand to the fellowship hall, into the sanctuary, and out the door to bring real change to our communities and society. The faith we proclaim can and should be bigger than a building. God is at work in moments of conflict. And God can still do new things. And in so many arenas of our life, we are certainly praying that God will do a new thing. Or that the Spirit may move in us, that we may be so bold as to listen to the voices that are crying out, to speak out against injustice, and to act in bold new ways. We do not need more martyrs of the faith. We do not need more victims of injustice. We do not need more names added to the refrain spoken at marches and protests. We do not need more families torn apart by violence. What we need is to be a church that is willing to grow, that is willing to embrace some pain, some growing pains, and one that is ready to engage with the conflicts of the world. And so may God be at work in the conflicts the church engages itself within, whether in the kitchen, in society, or in our own hearts. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith, adapted from the Confession of 1967. Wherever the church exists, its members 
are both gathered in corporate life and dispersed in society for the sake of the mission in the world. The church gathers to praise God, to hear the word, to baptize and join in the Lord's Supper, to pray for one another and the world, to enjoy fellowship, to receive instruction, to be renewed and reformed, and to speak out and act in the world as may be appropriate in times of need. The church disperses to serve God wherever its members are, at work or play, in private or in the life of society. Their prayer and study are part of the church's worship and theological reflection. Their words are the church's evangelism. Their daily action is the church in mission to the world. The quality of their relation with other persons is the measure of the church's fidelity. Each member is the church in the world, strengthened by the Holy Spirit with some gift of ministry and is responsible for the integrity of their witness wherever they may be. Amen. Our prayers today for the church, the world, and all who live in it end with a prayer that was written by the Reverend Dr. Diane Moffitt, Executive Director of the Presbyterian Mission Agency, in response to the numerous acts of violence in the news this week. Let's turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Gracious God, You have been with us in every time and place. From age to age, you travel beside us, and we are grateful for your presence and providing. We come before you with thanks and with hope and concern for your world. We lift up those who have slipped through the cracks, who have been overlooked, who are forgotten, not meeting the requirements. For all who are struggling yet don't qualify for help, and for those who are too proud to ask, and for those who feel helpless in the face of a system they can't navigate due to language barriers, time constraints, disability, fear, or lack of access, we pray for your help in opening doors and smoothing paths. We pray too that you would make us advocates for those in need. Show us how our skills and gifts can serve others whom we normally might not even see. We lift up those who are called to leadership in church, community, and nation. Give them wisdom compassion, flexibility, and an extra measure of your spirit to guide us in your kingdom ways rather than simply the way things are. Let your grace be at work in our lives and in theirs visibly and tangibly that together we may grow in love for our neighbor and for you We lift up those who face violence of any kind and every kind, from within and without. Holy God, we are tired. Our minds are heavy. Our hearts ache as again we witness broad violence and try to make sense out of the senseless. Hear our cries, O Lord. Equip us to be instruments of healing. Enable us to be bearers of light in these dark days of despair. Impart peace on your people. We ask these and all things in the name of the one who heals all division, 
who gathers us into his body and renews all life, Jesus the Christ. Hear us as we pray the way he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, may the Spirit guide us in our church and throughout creation as we engage and encounter conflict both throughout the world and in our own little corner of the community. And may we do so knowing that God is with us, that Christ is guiding us, and the Spirit nudging us along the way. Amen.